If you're looking to buy a Mac in 2024, don't make the same mistake I did. In 2020, Apple cut out Intel processors from their Mac lineup entirely. They haven't released a new Intel-based Mac since. Several of my videos cover this, I'd recommend this one. Anyway, a lot of people have been less than eager to make that jump from Intel to ARM in the form of Apple Silicon, which is what Apple have been putting in the place of Intel's chips. Let me go over why that's probably not a good thing, though. Firstly, putting money into an Intel Mac purchase is financially not a sound idea. Let's say you buy a 2019 16-inch MacBook Pro for 800 bucks right now. Those are powerful machines, granted, and it's a low price considering they're quite recent. ARM-based laptops are a long way ahead in terms of performance, though, as I regularly discuss, and the gap is only going to get bigger. In a couple of years, you'll want an Apple Silicon machine, as it'll be the only thing capable of keeping up with your workloads, and unfortunately, your Intel Mac's value will have dropped to virtually nothing. It's also highly likely Intel machines won't receive OS updates past Sonoma. This is the way when CPU architecture changes. It happened with PowerPC as well back in the mid-2000s. People do tend to idolise the era of unibody to retina MacBooks as super user-friendly and a great buy for consumers. That era was simply the best, back when computers could be taken apart by your mother-in-law's dog's friend, Alan. Steve Jobs had the customers at heart. Nasty Tim Cook just wants your money and will purposefully make your machine die before it's finished being useful. No, wake up sleepyhead. Apple didn't become top dog on the S&P 500 by showing morality and kindness towards their customers. Big publicly trading companies are not and have never been your friends. This sounds a bit harsh, but try and take the emotion out of buying a computer. Nostalgia has the effect of painting things in golden light a lot of the time, and that's how I felt buying a 2019 MacBook last year. 2019 was a great year, and the first i9s from that era were super powerful. I knew M1, which came in 2020, was more powerful on paper, but something told me the top dog of the Intel-powered MacBooks with its 16-inch screen, shiny touch bar, and original price of over £2,000 would be more suited to my needs. Somewhat predictably, I was wrong. I disliked the 2019 so much thanks to its heat problem, poor battery life, and mediocre single-core performance that I went back to a maxed-out 2012 Pro. With 16GB of RAM, a quad-core i7, and a terabyte of SSD storage, it was just about enough to help me start this channel, as well as get on with work from other areas of life. I was such a fan of the low price and repairability that I'd slowed myself down and held myself back from making more complex video edits and more. It didn't take long for me to pick up an M1 MacBook Air for exactly half the price of the 2019 I'd sold earlier, and realise how incredibly convenient, powerful, and overall valuable Apple Silicon Macs could be. Okay, let me quickly show you how some of the greatest Intel Macs of all time compare to more recent M1s, 2s, and 3s. The 2019 Mac Pro featured an Intel Xeon CPU with up to 28 cores. It caused big waves in single-core performance, but multi-core workloads was where this thing wiped the floor entirely. With the highest spec model costing over $50,000, we didn't think anything would be pulling ahead by much for years to come. Okay, true, M1 next year wasn't the weapon Apple Silicon needed to beat the 2019 28-core Mac Pro, but fast forward to 2023 and the M2 Ultra Mac Studio can get two times the score of that same Intel Mac Pro on Geekbench's multi-score test. They hold scores of 10,559 and 21,329 respectively. It's the same story in the single core test, in fact, with the Mac Studio doubling the 2019 Mac Pro's score of 1,349. So yeah, talking about these Apple Silicon Macs, we've got to the point now where after four years of releases, there seems to be an Apple Silicon Mac for everyone. Large screen power users on the go can have an M1 Mac 16-inch MacBook Pro with really top-of-the-line performance, or for a desktop user, the Mac Studio we just went over is almost slept on in terms of how powerful it is, considering the small size. Families and older folk will have a long-lasting and very capable machine in the form of the M1 or M2 iMac. The budget-friendly option is getting a used M1 Mac Mini, which for around £350 or $425 is a ridiculous steal. If you're after a laptop on the cheap, a base configuration MacBook Air with 8GB of RAM and the first M1 chip is, again, a no-brainer for £400 or $500. 
I use one daily in fact, and it's the machine each one of my videos with incredible production quality has been made on this year. Need I say more? You know, I don't think a lot of people realise this when buying a Mac, but the Intel machines have a level of charm to them which I'm sure keeps us buying them. The 17-inch MacBook Pro from 2009 to 2011 was the last line of 17-inch MacBooks Apple ever made. There's nothing like it out there anymore. The same applies with the Intel Mac Pros, they had so many cool little mechanisms and idiosyncrasies keeping them interesting for years after their release. That's why I still use my 2010 Mac Pro. Oh, and let's not forget the smallest MacBook of all time, the 2015 to 17 12-inch Retina MacBook. These were over 300 grams lighter than the current lineup of 13-inch MacBook Airs. Okay, I would like to concede there exists a use case for Intel Macs which cost under a couple of hundred bucks. These are undoubtedly going to save you half the price of an M1 machine, and if you don't need the performance, fair enough. Still, most people would be better off spending that extra money on something from the Apple Silicon lineup. You're investing in a longer lasting machine, you'll be able to achieve a lot more faster, and your OS will be up to date for years to come. Oh, and if it's a laptop you're buying, don't get me started on how much better Apple Silicon battery life is. Okay, there's one last thing actually. I know a lot of people will be ready to comment on this video saying buying an Apple Silicon computer is a foolish move because they are by nature not repairable in any way. Almost every part is either soldered or glued in, true, and you won't be upgrading the RAM anytime soon, unfortunately, but think about it. What do you really think is going to fail in 5-10 to 10 years? The RAM modules, the CPU, and the rest of the internals are very unlikely to develop problems if you're careful and don't spill liquid on your computer. Batteries are consumable items, I'll admit, but it's far from impossible to replace those with a little bit of adhesive remover and some tools. That's only actually necessary after a good thousand or so cycles of use most of the time anyway. I guess the last thing on the list is the SSD drive, where your data's stored. There's a fairly widespread fear that Apple's SSDs across their lineup, but especially on their cheaper Macs, are prone to failure after a certain number of reads or writes. The thing is, wide documentation exists online suggesting that not only do the SSDs require hundreds of terabytes written in order for failure to become a risk, but it's actually far more likely that the SSD controller will die. This isn't something that having a replaceable SSD would fix. Obviously there will be cases of failed parts where something like a unibody machine with more repairability would be better to have, but the argument is probably not as strong as you think it is at the end of the day. Okay, thank you very much for watching, and if you enjoy content like mine, you might want to join the Discord server where we talk about our favourite technology and occasionally other things. Two people joined my Patreon for the first time last week, and for that I'm really grateful. Big thanks go out to Adrian and to Oliver Wilderman. That's all for this week, and I'll see you next time.